the Hudson Library and Historical Society presents the 2018 Author Series featuring author Richard Munson speaking about his new book, Tesla, Inventor of the Modern. The fascinating story of genius inventor Nikola Tesla generally regarded as one of the greatest scientific minds ever to walk the face of the earth, but Tesla's name is little known to the average citizen. His brilliant electrical inventions are still in wide use today, over 100 years after their invention. Inventions such as the AC motor, the AC power grid, x-rays, remote control, radar, and the inductive coil that starts your car every day. Tesla, inventor of the modern, was recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on May 31st, 2018. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I also must uh, thank you for the invitation to this extraordinary library. I mean, for those people who live in this town, you have no idea how lucky you are. It's really, uh -oh. um, we're here to talk about Nikola Tesla. Um, he is enjoying a little bit of a popular revival. Um, Larry Page, who is the co-founder of Google. Um, recently referred to him as his hero. And in fact, he referred to him as the geek's hero, to go even further. Uh, and then, of course, he's probably most famous these days because Elon Musk's car and company are named after this individual. And I suppose in my small way, believing that he deserves more recognition than he currently gets, my hope is that this book sort of adds to that recognition. Um, so we're going to talk about why at least I think he uh, deserves it. My get observation is that there's those people who know a little bit about Tesla, they usually fall into two different camps. Um, one camp says that he's a superman, that he just invented basically everything, is an icon, made no mistakes, was just you know a saint, he probably rose into heaven, who knows. The opposite side, or, or another group, finds him a little quirky to be quite honest. And he had his quirks. I mean, he would, he abhorred jewelry. Uh, he would get a fever when he looked at a peach. He would count his steps so that um, if they were not divisible by three, he'd take his entire walk all over again. Um, my hope is to try to discuss why I think he is more interesting um, and important and entertaining than either of those uh, two camps. And so what I wanted to do for maybe about 20 minutes or so was to talk, at least from my perspective, about four things that surprised me while I was doing the research and perhaps might enlighten you about the man and maybe surprise you um, as well. So his, um, the extent of his genius and in influence, this man had 300, actually more than 300 patents. And he 
invented, he invented the electric motor, he invented long distance electricity transmission. According to the United States Supreme Court, he invented radio, remote control, robots, the list goes on. These are the underpinnings of our modern economy. Came from this one individual. The American Institute of Electrical Engineers said, were we to seize and eliminate from our industrial world the results of Mr. Tesla's work, the wheels of industry would cease to turn, our towns would be dark. Similar to what happened here. <laughs> See? <laughs> but I really didn't mean it. Um, but long after his death, um, his visions also inspired generations of creative minds to realize what he thought was possible. So he foresaw cell phones, radar, laser weapons, artificial intelligence, vertical lift airplanes, the list sort of goes on. Consider the cell phone, for instance. More than 100 years ago, he was talking about a device that you could put in your um, shirt pocket that would provide you with the daily news. You would get stock quotes. And he actually had this line. He said, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles. 100, maybe 10 years ago, he was talking about such a thing. He was, um, he sort of admitted that nobody really understands electricity. And I, I think even physicists, which there might be some in the room, might correct me, but I think in your silent moment, you'll even admit it's amazing. We love what it does. Keeps our beer cold, makes our appliances run, it does, you know, runs our refrigerators, et cetera. But Tesla, and while admitting that he didn't actually fully understand it, he was able to conjure it, to manipulate it, to control it. He was a magician in an odd way. Um, he created lightning. This was something that had been reserved for nature alone. And he was shooting sparks out 160 feet. He was able to make lamps glow that were not connected to any wires. He was, in fact, a magician. Tesla, of course, uh, he advanced a few quixotic notions that um, you might think um, made his legacy a bit more complicated. I think they made him more interesting. He spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to communicate with intelligent beings and other planets. He spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to read your mind by putting little monitors near your retina. Um, he also made mistakes. Uh, not long after the Wright brothers you know, flew in North Carolina, he declared flatly that airplanes were too heavy, they would never soar, and the only thing that could fly would um, the Count Zeppelin's dirigible. You know, he and um, Einstein uh, disagreed. He, Tesla thought that cosmic rays could go faster than the speed of light. He thought that if you split atoms, they wouldn't um, generate any energy. So he, he wasn't perfect, but I guess my point here is, on a batting average, he was amazing of what he both provided to us in reality and what he foresaw um, going forward. Take, for instance, um, radar. About 40 years before it was actually invented, he described the process by which you would transmit these you know, waves of energy and receive back their echoes, if you will, on a fluorescent screen, and you'd be able to conjure up what was in front of you. The French scientist that 40 years later actually developed it said that the only way he did it was because he relied on the precise apparatus and the principles that were stated by Tesla. He went on to say, and this one I love, Tesla may have been dreaming since he had at his disposal no means of carrying them out, but one must admit that if he was dreaming, at least he was dreaming correctly. My second surprise, as, as was um, noted in the presentation, um, I work at the Environmental Defense Fund um, trying to advance uh, clean energy technology. So it was a treat to actually realize that um, Nikola Tesla was a clean energy pioneer. Um, he is still, I guess, a, um, a model for um, developers of solar cells and batteries. Elon Musk, I mentioned before, um, also refers to him as a hero and recently gave a million dollars to restore Tesla's laboratory up on Long Island. Um, consider 
in the year 1900 um, in a magazine called The Century, which at the time was the largest circulation periodical in the United States, he wrote an article called The Problem of Increasing Human Energy with Special References to the Harnessing of the Sun's Energy. So this was published 118 years ago, and here were the first detailed looks as to how to capture um, the sun and the wind. So when I mix my jobs, my day job and you know, my weekend job of writing, I sometimes imagine what would it be like if Nikola Tesla came back today and thought about the electricity industry that he created. And my guess is he'd come up with some wild things. He'd be sending um, energy wire wirelessly. He'd be sending it um, probably through the earth so that people could pick it up um, you know, from plugging into the earth. He'd be figuring out how to generate it without having any pollution result. It's just his out-of-box thinking for, again, mixing my day and my, uh, my night on weekend job um, give me great joy and hope. The third surprise uh, for me is that this man struggled um, between, if you will, the present and the future. Um, you, can, you can call it apocryphal, you can call it appropriate, you can call it just weird, um, but this man who created artificial lightning, he was born during a lightning storm. At the stroke of midnight, between the 9th and the 10th of June, um, 1856. So this weirdness of his birth became part of Tesla family lore, and he sort of thought that he was kind of special because he was in a storm, a, you know, a child of light, as his mother called him. Um, as a biographer, I looked at him in a sort of a way of seeing him trying to struggle between, you know, today and tomorrow, but particularly between having, being grounded in the realities of the present and always envisioning the future. And he struggled with this back and forth. When he went too far off envisioning the future and sort of not having a basis in reality, and he wasn't a very good businessman to begin with. He went off and did some wacky things. When he was just focused on the present, he became bored. So this balance was important. Let's say, look at the year 1897. This is an important year for Tesla. Um, he and George Washington, this is Niagara Falls, um, they captured the power out, out of Niagara Falls and transmitted it first 26 miles to Buffalo and then 400 miles to New York City. This is a remarkable accomplishment because you have to realize that the technology that Thomas Edison was advancing, direct current instead of alternating current, would only send power maybe about a half a mile. 400 miles is extraordinary. And the New York Times referred to it as um, the you know, unrivaled engineering triumph of the 19th century. These are the generators um, that spin because of the falling water. And the, paper, the newspaper declared this remarkable achievement of the 19th century. They say, to Tesla belongs the undisputed honor of being the man whose work who made this Niagara project possible. So a statue on both sides of the Canada and the US side uh, commemorate him. So Tesla was famous. I mean, he had just accomplished the remarkable achievement of the 19th century, and he was bored with today. Who wants to do these practical things, basically, he said. I want to think about the future. So his response was, let's come up with a whole new science. And he decided that that science would be telematonics, as he described it, which we would refer to as robotics. And his first project was a radio-controlled um, model boat. And this thing is about four feet long and maybe three feet high. Um, he was capable of being a showman even though he was a rather shy scientist that was most happy when he was in his laboratory, he decided he'd put on a presentation at Madison Square Garden. This is the old Madison Square Garden, but it's a massive hall. Um, and this is 18, um, May of 1898. This is so just a few months after the battleship Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. So you can imagine our military was trying to think of, are there new weapons that might be kind of effective when it comes to boats? Um, and so, Tesla has here, he builds a pond in the middle of Madison Square Garden, places this little boat in there, um, invites reporters, investors, you know, other inventors to come watch him, and for about 10 or 15 minutes, he makes the boat move around. 
goes forward, it goes back. Rounds the pool, makes it dance like sort of a water bug, if you will. Everybody's mesmerized. You know, what, what is going on with this thing? There were theories in the newspapers afterwards. A lot of people thought it was enchanted. There was some magic spell was over it. My favorite one, though, was that uh, actually several people thought that there was a tiny little chimpanzee <laughs> inside that was directing the boat. Um, but he moved it back and forth. So after everybody is mesmerized, then he turns to the crowd and asks the question, who would like to ask the boat a question? And everybody has this blank look on their face. What do you mean, ask the boat a question? You know, and, and so some, it had to be some math nerd in the back of the room comes up and says, all right, what's the cube root of 64? Wise guy. Um, and Tesla, you can see his sort of hand is hidden there underneath the, the monitors. And he pressed the buttons to flash the lights on the boat four times. And he said that the crowd just went nuts. They, nothing he had ever done before or since uh, uh, produced that kind of sensation. His achievement is remarkable, particularly when you realize the failure of Marconi to do virtually the same thing. And Marconi, of course, gets the credit for inventing radio, even though the Supreme Court suggests that it was Tesla's patents that actually did it. So Marconi, just a few months after that, builds his own pond, builds his own little boat, and he puts at the other end of the, of the pond what he referred to as a Spanish ship. Remember, we're at the start of the Spanish-American War. And so he was going to maneuver his little boat over to the Spanish ship. And he had a little tiny you know, explosive. And he's going to blow up the Spanish ship. And he thought all the Navy admirals are going to think, yeah, we've got a new weapon. Um, so he gets it around, moves it over you know, to the, um, the Spanish ship, punches the button. Nothing happens. Spanish ship is fine, but suddenly there's an explosion in the back room because he had not realized how to individualize messages or in the way that Tesla had. And in the back storeroom is where Marconi had kept the rest of his bombs. And so suddenly <laughs> this blast of smoke and you know, grit and other things comes flying out. Um, Tesla, of course, had a huge imagination. And you know, thinking of this split between not really satisfied with the realities of today, but thinking bigger thoughts, you know, some people said to him, "All right, great, you got a you got a model boat, big deal." Other people would say to him, "All right, you got the the makings of a submarine that can go deliver bombs and blow up ships." And he said, "No, no, what you have here is the first non-biological form of life." It is a machine that is embedded with a borrowed mind. That mind, of course, was his. Um, so he, he foresaw artificial intelligence. He thought that this was a robot. And this robot um, would follow a course laid out um, or obey commands given far in advance. But, and here's the important part, it will be capable of distinguishing between what it ought and what it not ought to do. It's so almost 100 years ago, he was thinking, he created a robot, and he was allowing it to perceive that this would someday have the intelligence of this embodiment of a machine uh, to decide what it ought and what it not ought to do. OK, my fourth surprise. <laughs> And this is sort of the, the wonders of, of, or at least the joy of being a biographer. I was um, um, at the Smithsonian Institute in their archives, and they you know, brought out their microfiche, and I was spending you know, days sort of going through his schematics of his various designs. Not being an engineer, I was sort of lost as to what this is. So I turned to the librarian and said, is there anything else? Um, and, and she turns back to me and says, oh, you wouldn't really care about those boxes, would you? <laughs> And in these boxes were letters from Nikola Tesla to his friends, to his business associates. Um, you know, from a biographer's perspective, this is just a gold mine. <laughs> and so most people think of him as this remarkable genius, this superman. Somebody referred to him as a supernova in the galaxy of the human race. And I have to admit, there's no doubt that electric motors, robots, remote control, radio, these are pretty super accomplishments. But I want to suggest the thing that surprised me is that this scientist was also human. 
Charmingly so, to be quite honest. His best friends were the Johnsons. Robert was the editor of the Century Magazine, which I mentioned before at the time was the largest circulation um, magazine in the United States. And his wife, Catherine, um, they operated an intellectual salon in the Murray Hill neighborhood of Manhattan. So they would gather these grand dinners where they invite writers and sculptors and musicians to come and chat intellectually. Um, and um, one of the, uh, they were not particularly wealthy, but they acted that way and they you know, gathered these big crowds. One gentleman that came all the time, anybody know this one? Mr. Clements or, or um, Mark Twain, there in the background over here is um, Nikola Tesla. So after the dinners, the two of these guys would go back to Tesla's lab. And they were like guys playing. They would shoot off you know, lightning across the room and see what they could zap. They would you know, um, hold globes and, and twirl them and see if, you know, without wires to see how bright they could get them. They took x-rays of each other's hand. They were having a grand time. Um, so I guess my point here is that um, Tesla's relations, this is Robert a little bit older, um, his relations with the Johnsons, both Robert and also um, Catherine, um, reveal this sort of jovial, um, relaxed side to the usually intense uh, inventor. Um, they exchanged daily notes, if not several times a day. They were talking about the Johnson children, they were talking about um, Tesla's inventions, what other scientists were doing, you know, who had a boil or a you know, cold or all this sort of stuff. Just one uh, example of a letter which I thought was you know, endearing because Tesla had had a cold and so Robert writes to him and says, this is sort of the, the typical of just their close relationship. He says, it's been a whole week uh, since we saw you and you need cheering up. Come as early as possible and get cheered. We are in a jolly mood and the fire is lighted on the hearth and we only need you. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Tesla did not marry. Um, he did fall in love at the age of 23 with a young lady, um, his name is Anna. Um, they spent a summer in Austria walking through parks, planning out a family or um, you know, engineering you know, designs. Um, the relationship did not last after Tesla went off to engineering school. Um, but he was, he was a little bit of a flirt throughout his life, even this, though he was rather shy. He would talk to the Johnsons and say, um, you know, if a Miss Merrington is going to come over this evening, I'll make sure that I'm there and I'll be her victim. <laughs> this is Nikola Tesla. <laughs> he, however, um, had this belief that matrimony uh, was unacceptable for inventors. He basically said artists, musicians, sculptors, they could get married. They were kind of intellectual wimps in his mind. But um, an inventor had so intense of a nature and so much of it a wild, passionate quality that in giving himself to a woman he might love, he would give up everything and take everything from his chosen field. The only sad part here is that also one note that I found much later in his life um, suggested that he still believed that that to be true, that the inventor needed to be isolated and alone. But he did write, it's a pity for sometimes we feel so lonely. So this very human scientist um, reveled most, um, other than with his friends, about the excitement of discovery. I just have a few pictures of sort of Tesla through the ages, so I'll just sort of flip through these as, as I talk, but this is him at an early age. Um, he wrote that, I do not think there is any thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventor as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success. Such emotions make a man forget food, sleep, friends, love, everything. So throughout his life, I think what he was and why he is so unique is that he, he might have been one of the last curiosity-driven inventors. No, motivated by idealism. In comparison to, to Edison, for instance, Edison was an entrepreneur who basically invented because he wanted to make money. Nothing wrong with that, no criticism of Thomas Edison. But Tesla, you know, although admittedly when he did have money, and sometimes he did and sometimes he didn't, when he did have money, he enjoyed 
his you know, filet mignon dinners at Delmonico's. I mean, so it wasn't like he hated money. But he thought that technology transcended the marketplace and that invention should not just be tied to profits. He said, the desire that guides me in all that I do is the desire to harness the forces of nature to the service of mankind. Let me give two other um, observations, if I might, just on if Tesla was alive today, what I think he would, how he would look at modern inventing um, in this country. Um, first, he thought inventors needed to sort of mix a love of the humanities with a love of science. Um, and how that was best exemplified was that he envisioned the revolutionary electric motor while walking through a Budapest park quoting Goethe's Faust, the entire poem. And then he drew it, you know, the design quickly in the sand. But this mix of the humanities and science is something that we are somewhat missing. There was a, a, an article in the New York Times this past Sunday about the number of colleges that are closing down their humanities majors. If I had to guess, um, Tesla would, find, would be aghast at such a thing because he would argue that you close down the humanities and you're losing the potential for invention. And from invention comes innovation, comes you know, the gains from society. My second observation, um, and he didn't say this because he's not around, but um, I think he would have some concern about the move that now exists in inventing is that we rely upon large teams of researchers at universities or national labs or corporate research centers. Um, I was just at MIT um, last week and they were gleefully talking about how they were doing a research project and they had like you know, 165 you know, professors from different places that were doing it and Tesla would go, huh? <laughs> it was like, how many people do you need to spread a light bulb? Sort of, I mean, but uh, I think he would miss the power of an individual inventor. And that's something, I guess, he would probably argue that we are missing today. And we need to sort of more celebrate throughout school and other places, you know, the perhaps quirky but also um, genius inventor and give him or her more space to figure out um, what that future might hold. So no doubt um, Tesla aimed high, um, I think probably higher than any other inventor. He worked tirelessly to figure out how to bring electric power freely to the entire world. He thought about how to create robots that would reduce drudgery of our lives. He was, in short, driven by hidden forces that made sheer creation the most important thing in his life. And I would like to argue we are the better for it. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions. Um, hope you have them. <laughs> who wants to know what? Or who knows what? <laughs> yeah, in the back, please. You sort of answered my question at the very end. Apparently, Tesla did want to provide electricity free to the masses. Was that by? I'm not correct, he wanted to install microwave powers to beam electricity to home. Um, he had several different ideas. The one that he spent most of his time on was the thought that he would, with his artificial lightning, he would send lightning bolts into the earth, take advantage of what he thought was the earth's natural electrical charge, also take advantage of resonance, or basically the echo um, effect. Is think about a wave in a balloon. It sort of goes back and forth, and if you synchronize them, it becomes more you know, powerful. If you so yes, he thought he could do this. He could send things into the Earth. He created first a, a large tower in Colorado Springs. Um, and um, not long after that, he built an even bigger one up on Long Island. That's the one that Nikola, uh, that Elon Musk is helping to restore. But his thought was he'd send electricity through the earth and it'd be freely available so you or anybody could go into the ground and basically plug in a plug of some sort and you'd have free electricity. It obviously didn't work, um, although today, uh, I mean, his original idea about this wireless transmission, you know, came from uh, his early lectures, he would give these lectures and he'd have these, you know, sort of plates, metal plates on both sides of the, um, the auditorium. 
and in between, they were electrified, so anything in between them became electrified as well. That's why he, how he was able to make the lamps glow. So his, he figured, if I can do it 15 feet, I can, make, I can do it over the entire planet. So that was sort of the way that he thought. So he tried, and in fact, this was probably um, you know, why he ended up dying in poverty, because he spent all of his money trying to make this happen. Um, and it became you know, sort of the, his million dollar mistake, as it was referred to um, by the New York Times as the, uh, the Long Island facility got torn down. Yes, please. What, uh, what was his formal education background, and also uh, what was his uh, ancestry? Um, he was a Serb who was born in Croatia. Uh, his father was a Serbian uh, Orthodox priest. Uh, his mother was uneducated, but um, was, by all accounts, sort of an inventing genius. She, you know, came up with mechanical egg beaters and you know built all the furniture and all the clothes, you know, for the family. Um, relatives were either priests or military officers. Um, he was formally educated as an engineer. Um, and there's somewhat of a, a funny story because his father, um, there's lots of stories about his father, but his father in particular wanted him to become a priest, you know, and um, said, no way in, are you going to become an engineer. And so Tesla, here's, this, he's, he's so creative in, at times. He's on his deathbed. He's dying of cholera. And, he, and his father's going, oh my gosh, his, his, his older brother had died before, so he was like, oh my god, we're going to lose our only son. And Tesla, somehow or another, comes up with a muster and sort of coughs and says, I think I'll get better if I get to go to engineering school. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes to engineering school. Um, and um, you know, for two years, he has you know, brilliant marks. Um, we'll come back to this. But his father was never satisfied with him. He always you know, sort of thought fondly of his older brother, was the one that was supposed to be the family genius. And so Tesla sort of grew up um, you know, feeling inadequate um, because he couldn't live up to his father's expectations. So after these two years where he got top marks of you know, any engineering student possible, and his father was still sort of thinking, eh, your brother would have done better. So Tesla, he took up gambling and billiards, as a frustrated son might, moved to a, you know, a city without telling anybody where he was going, um, got arrested for vagrancy, uh, and was actually escorted back home by the police to you know, see his mother and father. Can you imagine their feelings about this? And in fact, it's sad to say, but his father died probably about four uh, months um, after that. So that was a rambling answer to your question. I hope I addressed it, sorry. Yeah, there in the back. I'm oh, using. Yeah, sure, yellow, sure. That's Can you speak at all to the relationship with Westinghouse? Yes. Um, George Westinghouse, um, um, actually, just before um, they had a relationship, um, Tesla, when he left Thomas Edison, um, went and started his own um, company doing street lighting in Rahway, New Jersey. Um, and in a pattern that would happen again and again, um, his um, partners swindled him. Um, so he basically lost out on his stock and all, everything associated with his company. He ended up a year digging ditches, making $2 a day. But he was digging ditches for these underground cables to run telegraph lines. And he kept telling the supervisor, you know, I've got a formula that's going to make this more efficient. And, you know, it's not like every ditch digger, you know, comes up with these things. And so they thought maybe this guy's bright. And he and so Tesla says, you know, I thought about, you know, at one the, in this Budapest park while I was, you know, quoting Goethe's Faust, I came up with this idea for this motor. And so th he actually then did find a lawyer who negotiated with Westinghouse, and Westinghouse bought all of his patents, which allowed the Pittsburgh industrialists to win the contract to light and power the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, and then after that, to win the contract that for Niagara Falls and to bring the power um, down to New York City. Now that said, then um, after, I'm not sure why these things are so long, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, after the Niagara Falls project, Westinghouse was, you know, he was spread a little thin financially. Um, and we also had at that time sort of a, a, a bit of a recession. So J.P. Morgan, the ruthless banker that he was, thought this was his opportunity to take over Westinghouse's empire. 
and create a giant electrical equipment trust like he did with steel and, and other things. Um, but Westinghouse realized that he needed to cut expenses. So his biggest, or one of his big expenses was a royalty to Nikola Tesla for these patents. So it was $2.50 per horsepower for each motor that was sold. If this had continued, Tesla would have been a billionaire. This was a huge thing. But Westinghouse realizes that he needs to cut expenses. So he goes to Tesla and says, you know, my company's about to go broke. Um, can you help me? And Tesla, this, who would do this? <laughs> Turns to Westinghouse and he says, you know, you've always been good to me. And you are the one that is going to bring my ideal, my motor, to the world. What happens if I just tear up the contract? He gave away about a billion dollars and would end up, as a result, um, in um, poverty in his later life. That was a rambling answer to your question. Was that, was that what you're looking for? <laughs> sure. In the back, I'm sorry. Um. You already answered. Okay. Yes, please. What do you do about the interplanetary space shuttle that was well, he, um, he, while he was in Colorado Springs, um, he had very sensitive, you know, sort of listening equipment, not, not necessarily for things from other planets, but, you know, trying to track lightning, what happened when lightning struck the ground and how long it would resonate and whether there'd be an echo coming back. So he had very sensitive recording equipment. He thought that he heard something um, from another planet. Um, and he, you can, think of it one way or the other, but he made the mistake from his perspective later of telling a journalist that he had communicated with some, something, someone from Venus. And basically everybody else just sort of said, you're out. <laughs> so, um, and he didn't really return uh, to it. I mean, he talked about it, you know, um, sort of informally, but that was his only sort of time and he just got bashed down by people who just thought he was crazy. Yes, in the back. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that oscillator that he invented that almost brought down New York City? <laughs> um, he had this um, device, which wasn't that big, um, that um, was called an oscillator, but it would, it would basically shake things. Um, and in his lab, um, he had this oscillator going, and it started shaking you know, the room, and things started falling off the shelves and stuff of this sort. Um, and he was living at a time in an Italian community of New York City um, where people who had, they were new immigrants basically from the Vesuvius region of, um, of Italy. <laughs> so they start feeling the, the, the shaking out in the street and you know, they're thinking, this is not good. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, he, Tesla of course keeps cranking it up, things keep shaking, they're falling off. You know, they're, and suddenly the police come to the door and start banging on the door, thinking, what the hell are you doing? And so he finally took a, you know, a hammer to it and basically smashed it. The police came in and he said, oh, what's going on? <laughs> As if nothing had happened. He came up with the theory that he could use this to basically shake down any building in New York City if he wanted to, um, you know, shake down the, the Brooklyn Bridge. He even had, um, suggested that he could uh, cause the earth to get split in half. Um, there's a, um, a TV show um, used to be called The Mythbusters, um, where they actually went off with a similar oscillator to a bridge, an older bridge, and tried this experiment. I don't know if, how they knew exactly what frequencies they, you know, that Tesla was using. And they did say, yeah, the bridge really shook, but it didn't fall down. Um, so um, sort of a long-winded answer to your question. Yes, please. How much truth is there to you know, the last couple of years of his life, he was basically a recluse, apparently living yes. in some hotel in New York, talking to pigeons, and he died. Yes. And, and they swooped in allegedly, they took all his papers, yep. the FBI, the, the government officials. Yep. How, how much truth is there? A lot. Um, in his later years, um, you know, like in his, um, you know, you saw his previous, he's probably, he was 75 here when he got on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and in this period, um, and even later when he was probably about 81 or so, he would have, uh, for his birthday, he would invite reporters into his room at the Hotel New Yorker, and probably 40 to 50 of them, 
you know, like the New York Times, the New York Herald, I mean, big reporters would come and sit there for like five or six hours and listening to this 70 or 80 year old pontificate about whatever he thought his new brainstorm was. And some of these were wacky and some of them were envisioning cell phones or radar or lasers or other stuff. One thing that he did come up with is he claimed that he had done the schematics for what he considered to be a death beam. This would be a weapon that would be able to knock out battleships, airplanes, entire armies. So he dies in about 1943, and we're about to enter World War II, uh, or in World War II, and you can imagine the FBI is not really wild about allowing our enemies to get access to the schematics for a death beam. So they call in um, the FBI, and the FBI rounds up um, you know, all of his papers from all of the various hotels that he ever lived in, in his warehouses, et cetera, and they you know, um, identified a distinguished professor from MIT um, who was the head of the High Voltage Research Lab, um, member of the National Academy of Sciences, to come down with Naval Intelligence and the FBI for about six days and go through his papers. Um, they, this professor decided that this one paper that Tesla had written was so clear about what we would now call you know, um, Star Wars type weapon that he slapped a top secret um, rating on it and it's never really been seen. The rest of it he said was basically the ramblings of an old man. Here's the important question for you. Who was the professor that they invited to come and review all of this material? John Trump. Do you know who John Trump is? MIT professor, National Academy of Science, and uncle to the 45th president of the United States. <laughs> really? So when, 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 when candidate Trump was running for office, he would refer to his uncle as, I've got a really smart uncle at MIT. It's in the family blood. We're really smart. <laughs> I couldn't make that up. <laughs> In the back. Yes. Um, are there any documented events that maybe Tesla visited Ohio or even in Akron with all the bidders and patents and stuff that we have? Not that I know of, uh, or, or not that's occurring to me at the moment. I could make up something, but like no, like <laughs> I don't. I don't remember anything. Sorry. Yes, please. Can you briefly comment on his supposed contentious relationship with Edison? It was an odd relationship, um, and it went sort of back and forth, if you will. He was, um, his first job um, was to install Edison phone systems in Budapest and Paris. Um, but, you know, on the side, he was thinking about electricity, and he was, he was quoting Faust and coming up with his electric motor. But he did such a good job installing these phone systems that his supervisor said, I'm sending you to New York to work with Thomas Edison himself. And he wrote probably the greatest letter of recommendation anybody could get. He says in this letter to Thomas Edison, he said, I know of two great men. You were one of them, and the other is this young man. So, Edison obviously hired him. He did great work. Um, but the two of them were just different. Um, you know, Tess Edison was kind of frumpy, um, sometimes a little crass. And I don't mean that in a mean way. He was just, you know, kind of. And Tesla, in comparison, he was this distinguished European intellectual who spoke eight languages fluently. And he dressed like he was going to the opera. You know, so th these two of them just didn't see eye to eye, you know, personally. They also had different inventing styles. Edison was totally by trial and error. He just kept trying things until they worked. He was a genius at it. Tesla, in, uh, in comparison, you know, used mathematical formulas and did what he called cerebral engineering. So every, he did it all in his head. He, in fact, he said, I, you know, redesigned things hundreds of times. I didn't have to draw schematics. I just, you know, would come up with the final product and then they'd make it for me. Um, the biggest thing, of course, is that they disagreed totally on um, whether electricity should be transmitted by direct current, which Edison wanted, versus alternating current, um, which um, Tesla wanted. Um, they, um, and, and then I suppose they, the real falling out, I mean, Tesla idolized 
Edison um, while he was working for him. Um, but he, Tesla, felt that Edison had made a promise that he would be given a bonus if he increased the output of Edison's dynamos or his, um, or his generators. And so Tesla spent about you know, six months tripling the output of Edison's equipment. And he turns to the Wizard of Menlo Park and says, can I have my bonus? And Edison you know, puts his feet up on the desk and starts laughing at him. And in the most cruel, I, I think one of the most cruel statements you can make to a young immigrant, he basically said, when you become a real American, you'll appreciate an American joke. Tesla, of course, did not laugh. He put on his bowler hat and walked out the door. That said, can I just say, I mean, when at one point um, Tesla's um, laboratory burned down uh, and he lost everything, his notes, his equipment, everything at all. And relative to Westinghouse, Westinghouse, although his company was somewhat being taken over for him, the Westinghouse company turned to Edison and said, we're happy to provide you with equipment, but you know, to sort of pay us up front. Um, that's where their relationship had gone, largely because Westinghouse himself had sort of been ostracized from the company. Um, Edison, in comparison, even though they had this cantankerous relationship, Edison turned to him and said, use my lab. Come on over, it's yours until you, know, you get yourself set up again. So it was an odd relationship, but um, sometimes unbelievably tense and sometimes actually sweet. Later in their lives, they actually exchanged letters, talked about you know, Edison's daughter's wedding and um, all sorts of other things. So it was, a, it was a weird relationship. What else? Yes, please. How did he manage construction of all of the equipment that would appear would have been needed to demonstrate this array of uh, ideas? It would seem as he would need a large workforce. <laughs> well, he had a, about five assistants himself um, that, you know, blew glass for, you know, his bulbs or, you know, put together things. I mean, some of the equipment he would just buy from Westinghouse, you know, company. Um, because it was available that way. But even though he had some assistance, um, you know, he was the force behind this. Um, and um, he just sort of dictated how the laboratory would run, but he, he did have some help um, to get the equipment to work together. Yes, please. How did alternating current become the standard? And I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Alternating current, how did it become the standard? Um, it was a better technology, in short. Um, I mean, what Edison um, just felt that current needed to be um, moving in one direction. That just made sense to him. Um, whereas, um, and what he had to do to do that, because usually when, I'm not an engineer, but my impression is that as you spin you know, a generator, you know, it goes up and down, it moves backwards and forwards. And he, Edison, had to come up with what was called a commutator to, you know, sort of uh, put this all in one direction. And that lost a lot of energy. It was very inefficient. Um, Tesla's genius is that he realized that he could create a, um, an electric motor that didn't need a commutator, that could run directly on alternating current. And the one great advantage of alternating current is you can what's called step it up or increase its voltage and then send it really long distances and step it down again and, and bring it into people's houses. And that's what he did on the Niagara Project, moving electricity about 400 miles. A remarkable accomplishment. Wasn't there an issue um, locally in New York City with, because obviously the only the very wealthy were even contemplating electricity and their houses were catching on fire? <laughs> yes. Well, this was the, um, again, uh, the philosophical side of this debate between direct and, and um, alternating current, which became known as the war of the currents. I'll tell you about the, the gruesome part of it in a second. But it was also uh, this notion of who should get electricity. You know, Edison and most everybody at the time felt that it would remain a luxury item, that J.P. Morgan and his ilk would put little generators in their basements and you know have their electricity, but everybody else would remain with gas lamps and uh, things of that sort. Um, Morgan did put a generator, an Edison generator, in his basement. Um, his neighbor, a distinguished um, aristocratic um, lady, um, felt that it was shaking her silver. Um, <laughs> so he had to spend a lot of money to um, put foam all around it. And then she decided that um, 
the fumes were causing her silver to turn gray. Uh, so the list went on sort of for, for a long time. But I mean, Tesla came to this thinking, I want to bring electricity to the masses. Um, and the only way to do that was to figure out how to send it longer distances than what direct current would. Um, it also wasn't causing fires. Well, uh, um, that's, it, it was um, the, the point for Edison in this um, fight of the war of the currents, um, in large part because he was protecting, understandably, his investment in direct current and the systems. Um, he had an associate. There's a lot of debate whether, you know, um, how involved Edison was, but some associate that had access to his lab decided to demonstrate that alternating current was really dangerous, so dangerous that you wouldn't want it in your house. So, you know, he electrocuted a dog, he electrocuted a horse, he electrocuted cats. I mean, the list sort of goes on. And then he convinced the New York State Legislature that they should no longer hang or shoot um, horrid criminals, they should electrocute them. Um, and the first person that got this treatment um, it was a totally botched, uh, horrible, horrible, gruesome scene. Um, but you know, I think it was after that and realizing that um, what happened both in Chicago with the Columbian Exposition and at Niagara Falls, that alternating current was just by far the better technology. Yes, please. I was always trained at Steinmetz, who was the father of AC machinery. What was the relationship between Steinmetz and, and Tesla? Depends upon who you ask. Steinmetz um, was sort of the face of and the chief scientist for General Electric for many years. Brilliant man, um, although, um, well, we won't get into his deformities, but I mean, he was, um, I guess um, most um, histories that I have read of them would suggest that Steinmetz um, did remarkable things in trying to, um, sort of understand the, 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 both the resonance and the delay associated with um, an electrical current, but that he largely used the inventions of Tesla to actually do um, his electrical generation. I, don't, I didn't study that enough to know that I'm you know, comfortable enough in coming to that conclusion, but that seems to be sort of the general feeling about it. That no knock on Steinmetz. I mean, he was a, a brilliant man. There's all these pictures of Steinmetz with Einstein and other great scientists. He, he really was quite remarkable. Anyone else? Yes, please. On NPR, I heard a uh, story that a hotel bought the building that Tesla lived in and now offers his room um, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a rental. Is that, is that true? Um, I heard that too, and I tried to investigate it, and I couldn't find that to be true. Okay. Um, it still could be. That just uh, <laughs> I, I didn't find it. I guess we have time for one more. Is that this lady in the back? This lady in the back. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, I was curious. The current with him is the uh, very revolution in, uh, in physics, and I was wondering how he interacted with uh, like Bohr and Einstein and all these others, the, the great minds. You talk about the theoretical. Uh, you're doing all these thought experiments, and was, I, I, how was uh, Tesla? Uh, he's in the same place at the same time. Well, uh, Einstein was about what, 20 years younger than Tesla? Um, and Tesla ended up um, having a pretty much of a 19th century view of electricity. He thought that it went through what you know, scientists of the day called the ether. It was this sort of unknown, sort of the atmosphere. That's just sort of what it went through. Um, and Einstein said, you know, we really don't need uh, the concept of ether to think about light traveling through uh, or sound traveling through anywhere. And so um, Tesla really rejected most things that Edison, or, or excuse me, that Einstein came up with. As I mentioned before, um, Tesla claimed that he split an atom and no energy came out. Uh, he argued that, um, you know, he thought he could send things faster than the speed of light. Um, that said, the two of them still exchanged a fair number of letters back and forth, and at Tesla's death, one of the nicest tributes actually came from um, Albert Einstein, referring to him as the genius who brought us you know, electricity and so many other cores of our economic foundation. But even with quantum mechanics, he was still, that was beyond people. It was, 
I think at that time, um, my view is that he was, um, I, I'm getting to be an old man myself, getting, <laughs> so at, at a stage that, that he just wasn't open to new ideas. Um, he sort of had his view of the world and it was a, a 19th century view of how energy moved um, through the atmosphere and he just, he couldn't grasp where Einstein was. And you know, to be honest, probably most of us today still can't grasp where Einstein was, but um, that's, a very interesting dichotomy. Yes, you're exactly right. Well, listen, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the book. Um, Please remember to pick up brochures in the back of upcoming authors, and I hope you'll join us in the rotunda for a reception for our author. Thank you for coming. Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the 2018 author series for the citizens of Hudson. Follow Mr. Richard Munson on Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, or visit his website at tesla-book.com.